Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. We got a phenomenal guest. Ryan Skinny Shanahan is here with us. Um, um, and unlike Dave and I, he pulled up in a super cool car, a DeLorean. So what is it about this Back to the Future DeLorean? What, what you got in there? <laughs> oh man, this car. Um, I've had it for a little while. Mm -hmm. It was a dream of mine uh, to own one of these things. Did you see Back to the Future? Oh, I did. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would never have known it was a car if it wasn't for that movie. Exactly. I loved that film when I was a kid. Exactly. But I always thought that it wasn't real, like, um, like the Batmobile or something else. I thought it was just in a movie. Mm -hmm. Then when I found out it was a real car, I was like, I have to have Gotta it. Gotta have it. And ever since then, it was this desire, just this itch that I needed to scratch. Yeah. And eventually, I found one and it was in really bad shape. So I decided I would um, kind of take on the hobby of buying one, which everyone thought I was crazy for doing it. Of course. And, uh, and restoring it from the ground up. Did you really? What's in yeah. it? Well, I mean, what isn't in it? <laughs> I, I tell you, this thing was in really bad shape when I first got it. Yeah. And I've replaced just about everything. Right. And I, um, one part that I had a lot of fun doing was obviously the sound system in it. Yeah. I and I built, that, I built that all up. I did a Pioneer head unit. I did all JBL speakers wow. and an Infinity amp. Oh, God. And I gutted the whole car, tore out all the interior. God. And this was kind of, I mean, I, don't, I didn't really know how to do these things. And I was kind of on my own. Wow. I'll, I'll show you later what it looks like okay. because I, I'm actually yeah. kind of pretty proud of that. And you guys get to yeah. see these pictures. I mean, amazing. The, do you ever go listen to your mixes in your car? I do. Okay. I do. Um, I have two cars because... Um, I don't fully trust the DeLorean to have it as my only car because it's not the most reliable thing in the world. Mm -hmm. It is now, but you know, still, right, right. you gotta have a second one. Right, right. And um, I, I always, every car I have, I, I custom build out the sound system myself yeah. and I tune it myself because yeah. I do need that as a reference point. Okay. It's still very important to me. Dave, do you remember that A&M, when it was A&M, it's now the Henson lot, they had a, a 65 something in the back that was wired into all their rooms. So when you yeah. did your mixes, you could yeah. actually go sit that. out in the car oh, wow. and see what that. it sounded like from a consumer standpoint. Yeah. And that was, they did that like 15 years ago. It's really, really amazing. At so, that same time, by the way, I built a, a an, an FM transmitter mm -hmm. and uh, I, 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 uh, I didn't realize that I had, I was blowing out the whole neighborhood. <laughs> And, and, and the F, FTC came by. Oh, really? I got in trouble. Anything that starts with an F is likely trouble. Yeah. Probably. One of the things that is really fabulous about your career is that in the dual hats you wear, you mix with a lot of artists. There's a lot of other people. Think. Yeah. And so define what the collaboration is with Zed because it's a little bit different, correct? It's a little different with him because uh, he mixes all of his own records himself. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I, I'm basically in the engineering capacity in that camp and I do mostly uh, all the vocal work ah. unless we have, because he plays drums as well. So when we have stuff where he oh, plays, like, yeah, he's an amazing drummer. Oh, wow. Um, a lot of people don't know that about him. Huh. Uh, self, Self-taught drummer, and he is incredible. Wow. Doesn't practice, insanely good. Wow. Um, he's just, he's one of those musicians that can play multiple instruments and is just good. Nice, um, nice. And so uh, if we have a live drum kit, then I'll mic it up, I'll track it, okay. and I'll do a little bit of pre-mix and get it right. And then we will take it out of my session and drop it into his mix project. Mm. And then he will take it across the finish line with what's left. So I kind of, I fill in the gap for everything that needs to be recorded that's organic. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna say, what's, what's, it now explains more to me about Zez music mm -hmm. because you're actually doing tracking. Yes. You're miking live drums. Yes. You're doing, that's analog shit. Yeah, kind of. oh yeah. And, yeah. And, and the idea that he thinks that way yeah. and then gets it to amazing. Yeah, and I think, um, one, for, for me, I really, um, my, my point of pride, I guess, in that camp is the vocal stuff, the vocal work, because um, being with him, it just, it really, he's so, um, he, well, I am too, but I also get it from him being really, really detail oriented. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really important to get everything as perfect as possible. Mm -hmm. And so with the recording process, with the vocals, it, it really kind of pushed me um, I think from where I was at before working with him to another level mm -hmm. of really shooting for the best possible mm -hmm. product that we could get. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, once we get everything recorded, we both sit down together and we do the comp and I'll do a little premix on the vocals, get everything ready and then start shooting stems over to him. And then we'll apply certain effects that we had in one session in the other. Wow. And I would actually, one thing I want to actually say about the process is that I think 
when we're working on vocals, I'm not sure if there are, I know Max Martin's camp does it like this, but there's few people that probably spend the amount of time that we do on a vocal. We've spent an entire week just working on comping a lead vocal, like a single vocal. We've done that numerous times in wow. the past. So wow. the, there's like, you know, it's hours and hours spent on slivers and slivers and nudging, even if it's a great singer, just to Get try and right. achieve the best thing possible. It says everything about why it's successful. Mm -hmm. You got to put in the time. Absolutely. In the Zed relationship, mm -hmm. which um, I think from a, from a couple of places, one, watching and being responsible for a sound that becomes such an institutionalized and big thing, mm -hmm. people understand the weight of that, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's on you as well. Yeah. Um, and then are there things that you learn from him and he learned from you? It's absolutely like that, um, especially in the beginning. When, when we first met, um, I was working as an in-house engineer at Interscope. Okay. And I didn't start out as, as his engineer. Um, I came on as an assistant engineer and my friend uh, Mitch Kenny sure. at the time yep. was uh, doing the engineering job. And Mitch decided, because he's from Australia, yep. and at the time he decided he was wanting to move back because he had been in LA for many years. And at that point, um, Zed or uh, Anton, because I, right. I always refer you know. to him as Anton. Sure. Anton asked if I would want to you know, step up and do the job that, that Mitch was doing since Mitch was leaving. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, absolutely, I'd oh, love to do yeah. it. And so I'd already been engineering for other artists for a few years okay. at the label. And him and I just got along so well in the beginning mm -hmm. that it just was kind of the next natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was this you was guys back, back there where Mixed by Ali was. In, he had a room. He in had a room back, back then. Yeah. 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 Yep, sure. Yeah. That, and TDE yep. like took over half the building. Yeah. Yep. And it was uh, it was a really fun time to yeah, be there. Absolutely. Actually. Absolutely. Um, and in the beginning, I, I'd say kind of one of the um, the back and forth thing with with us is in the beginning, Anton didn't know a whole lot about uh, vocal work. Mm. He was an amazing amazing producer, musician, mixer, the whole, the whole yeah. gamut. But when it came to vocals, he was, he, he knew obviously about, you know, the basics of vocals, but sure. when it came to certain parts of vocal production, like stacking and, and different things that you do, um, I was a little more versed at the time in that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of brought that to the table in the beginning, starting to work with him. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him in terms of production, sound choice, different mixing techniques, things like that. Wow. Because he's just a legend of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. He, he was like nothing else that came out. It was like, wow, what is this kid doing? I, it was, it was mind-blowing to me. Um, it was around a time also when, when Sonny Skrillex yep. was, and that the whole thing was happening and it was just these, it was, it was a thing where I, I can just remember a, a turning point where I heard this music and it was one of the first times in my life where I was like, I've never heard anything like this before. Absolutely. This is something new. And, and I got to tell you, the impact, just personally, it for me was, here was music that made you move. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to necessarily be made by people who were so adept at producing or so adept at playing. It was how they took tools mm -hmm. and got to the energy they felt that was really crowd driven. It yeah. was, they didn't have to make songs for arrangements that were for radio. Right. It was, there was a freedom to it that made it kind of rebellious. Yeah. And, and then the other thing is just everything had a groove and, and just there was this mashup of different elements and then the leaders of it, Skrillex, yeah. Zed and so on and so forth, they were so way out in front of everybody else that they lasted through the transition of people. Is that, am I accurate? hundred percent. And I think in addition to that, um, part of Anton's strength was his pop sensibility that he incorporated mm. into the rest of that. Mm. And it was his, his way of understanding, understanding uh, like the palette of people that liked his music Yes, and really like dialing in on that. That's I think that is way. one of his huge strong points because, um, his ability to make music and his taste is a really, really wide range. Yeah. But yeah. he's very cautious and selective about what he puts together. Mm -hmm. He does music for him. And then in other tracks, he will know what, how, like, there's a line basically where he goes, okay, I, I, I want to push it every time I do a song to bring more mu musicality into popular music. Wow. That's kind of, that's, always since the very genius. beginning. Our audience needs to go right, now when this when this when this is over and go to clarity 
Yeah. Everything we're talking about is in the song Clarity. It's amazing. I listen to it every day and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's, tell, tell them, tell them, you know it better than I do. I mean, Clarity was, a, Clarity was an interesting thing. Clarity was an album that happened while we were working on an album for Lady Gaga. Mm. And it happened simultaneously. Um, Anton was working on production and ideas for her, mm -hmm. but Clarity was made kind of in the in-between. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was interesting because we had, we had a room in Interscope and this room was just kind of, I wouldn't say given to us, but we had it 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. yeah. every day for three or four months mm. and just used it to its absolute fullest. Yeah. Explored a bunch of different ideas and just had the freedom to you know, go ahead and create. Mm -hmm. And he was able to just do a bunch of different ideas and then start to kind of slap them together. Yeah. Um, and what a lot of people, when they hear those songs, a lot of people think, you know, that they obviously the mix sound, sounds great and everything, but to be honest with you, the mix in, in that genre, especially with him, is such a smaller part of it because he, he really, he mixes as he Love produces. That. It's all about sound selection and yeah. choice. Like, yeah. it's not about fixing it later, it's about getting it right first. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes down to the actual mixing phase, it's, it's small tweaks done. here and there, yeah. Yeah. right? It's just, it's just the, the fine details. That's part of the freeing of it that I found. Mm -hmm. The guests that we've had on in the space over time, um, our award show would find folks that were in that space. Um, and anytime they came on, they didn't have the same restrictions. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm gonna go do this, and it's gonna feel good at this point in time, and I'm gonna play it in my next set, and let's go. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was, it was a cutting to the chase, but it was, it wasn't disrespectful of anything in the past, it was just a new way to do stuff. Yeah. And, and I think that trends and music and technology and rock and roll and all that stuff is about moving forward. Yes. Uh, and it was almost punk-like, and it's, it's like, oh no, we're doing this this way. In this case, technology is really kind of what's driven that genre. Because 100%. You, you had this, this kind of, I mean, plugins and computers and everything were still getting to a point where you didn't need the analog side of things, you didn't need a big studio to make things that sounded amazing. Right. You just, you needed a laptop. Right. And it was those producers at the time that really utilized that to the fullest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We never in, in the Zed camp, we never use analog synths usually ever. Wow. Maybe we'll use a piano or something, um, right. or a keyboard or like a Nord, something like that. But mm -hmm. rarely, it's all in the box. Right. 100%. Unbelievable. D did you ever, go out on the road with him to sort of feel what that crowd response was and, and help inform Oh, what absolutely. You're doing. Yeah. Um, I don't do a lot of, like, I never go and do live sound for him, right. but I do do playback gotcha. sometimes for, like, when we go and do, like, television appearances, sure. bigger radio shows, things where we have, like, a, usually a guest singer or mm -hmm. other musicians that are playing along with. Then I'll go out and do that. But the, but the crowd's response has got to be informative to the next production cycle. 100%, yeah. And, and even when things are not 100% finished, he will, he'll make a version of them mm -hmm. and he will incorporate them sometimes in like the next show he's going to play. So, yeah. Just to test out not just the sonics, but Love to see that. sort of the reaction did, that yeah. people have to it. Did he, uh, did he, what do you think about the Atmos world? I mean, the Atmos world is cool. Um, we haven't really dived in a whole lot into the Atmos yeah, world. I'm the same way. I don't want to speak on his behalf yeah. um, with it, but I think that it's, uh, it's just kind of the Wild West with it so far. Mm -hmm. And I think it will make more sense if it finally, or when it finally transitions over into making a production in Atmos. Right. And then your afterthought is the two mix, right? right Instead right, of right. the way it is now, which is right. the exact opposite. Yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful for, for movies. And Incredible. In, uh, Gaming, yeah, and all movies, that kind of gaming, stuff. all that—it's unbelievable. And maybe a car too here or there. Maybe exactly. maybe that could go in your car. It's true. Well, <laughs> I will I will tell you that a year ago I went to an event, and I'm going to invite you to a facility to see this facility. It's called Fab Factory, but I went to an event. You did too, where Dolby had their Tesla. Oh, yeah, I've Atmos, heard about the Dolby Tesla. Atmos yeah, Tesla. Yeah, yeah. I've heard about and, this. Um, crazy. You know, and and I remember taking that. home somebody from Abbey Road. I was taking um, our friend to the airport. And he was just going off on how he could hear music, not from the footwell, but from the footwell and in the middle and from the top in the Atmos mix yeah. in, a, in, a in, in a car. And that that was coming. And I was like, 
I'm already overwhelmed at that, you know, <laughs> down here. So I forgot about that, Herb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there is. So at some point in time, and I'll oh, share with you off, off camera while you come by. What people, I think, don't necessarily understand because it's so hard to get there mm -hmm. is when you're part of something that's really successful, then there's, what's next? Right. You know, and that's always sort of pending. Right. Um, and so you're in this position, you're doing stuff with Zed and other artists, mm -hmm. some to be named, some not to be named. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to go? Where is it? What's the future? What, what are you excited about? Well, uh, for me, actually, at, at this point in time, the only time that I ever usually go in and engineer stuff is, is with, with Zed. Uh -huh. um, I usually only uh, outside of his camp wear the mixing hat at this point. Got it. That's pretty much my passion is mixing records. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. That's, yeah. that's where I sit down and go, okay, now's my time. And now exactly. I can take my time and experiment and play with it. Do you do all that in one place? Like does, it, yeah. okay. So I, do. I, I, have, I have my own spot that I, I mix pretty much all the records that I mix. Gotcha. And then when you're working with Zed, do you go to his spot or do you stay at your spot? Um, I go to his spot because we, through the, through the course of time, we've built multiple studios in different houses that gotcha. he's had. And finally, we have one in his, in his current house that's just spectacular. Just yeah. Got it, got it's it. It's amazing. Got it, got what it. kind of speakers are you using? In my studio, huh? I have three sets. Um, I use a pair of, let's see, what do I have? I have Focals, mm -hmm. uh, the Solo 6s, uh, obviously the classic NS10s, mm -hmm. just for my mid-range re mid reference, and I use uh, some JBL 705s. The 7 Series are pretty good. <gasps> it, they're insane. They're, they're thing, insane. I remember when I first heard those, um, I believe it was actually here. Mm. Um, and we were brought into a large room, and they were all, they were all kind of set up, small to big. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing the 705s, and like the first, the first comment was, well, where's the sub? Stop it. And the answer was, there wasn't. And, and I'm like, no how are one. these little speakers going this low? They're amazing. The, the range on them is incredible for their size. Becky got me a pair, and I, I'm in an apartment. Yeah. And so literally, I can just blow off the back half of my building with it. <laughs> and they get super loud without distorting. And, and, and the other thing, as I, I'm known, I'm, 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 I'm becoming a meme in doing this because JBL speakers always have ass. Mm -hmm. they they do. Always, it's true, they do. They have ass. And so you end up with this, because I really like more of a high end when I'm listening because I get more colors. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm not the technical guy, just, but I got a pretty good ear and so I want to hear it a certain way. And they are right there in a clean way with yeah. that booty yeah. that just, and that combination. So they're powerful, but accurate. And it's the definition. Yeah, in the low end that's depth. what it is. It hits, but it's not muddy. Right. Thank you. Yeah, See, they, that's when tech awesome. guys say it right. I'm like, it's got ass. He's saying no. <laughs> yeah. So I have to do better than I that. I use a subwoofer with the other two sets of speakers that I mentioned. With those, I don't. You don't have to. No. That says it with all. With those, I just, I, as is. That, that says it all. Yeah. AKG's got just incredible gear. Any pro tip? that you'd give to the audience about it? Well, I'd say one pro tip is definitely using a match pair of 414s for overheads on a drum kit. Mm. Some people overlook that, but man, it can really, really Make lock a in a sound. Yeah. And with you are being around drummers who have very specific kind of needs. An entire family of drummers, yeah, actually. So yeah, there you all go. the way back. There you go. Yeah. Any stories that have just been amazing with utilizing JBL or AKG things in your past? It was just, um, it was a surprise when we were, uh, it was actually Anton and I and his whole crew, and we were brought into a room full of new JBL speakers that hadn't been released yet. Mm. And we listened to all of them, and I just remember that everyone in the room was just shocked that the little ones, mm -hmm. uh, the 705s, the little guys, mm -hmm. had so much range and also so much low end. We were just blown away that that happened with a speaker. Yeah. And I can't remember ever listening to a speaker of that size that did something like that. I'm constantly amazed yeah. at what can happen with some JBL speakers. Yeah. It really is. Definitely stuck in my mind, and I was like, I have to have a pair of those. And I remember starting out with the, um, with the passive ones mm -hmm. and running like, uh, just running an amp that was in another room that was noisy, and it was just whatever it took to kind of get those up and get running with them, mm -hmm. and then eventually swapped them out with the active versions when those came out. There you go, JBL. You take your good horses with you when you're going into things. Um, <laughs> You got stuff coming up that AKG's playing a role in? Absolutely, 100%. Um, in the Zed camp, we just got done building a brand new studio. Mm. Um, and we have a dedicated drum kit now, which is something that we've never had in the past in that camp. Wow. And so 
I'm integrating a lot of different AKG mics into this kit in ways that I haven't done before to be a little bit more experimental because we now have the time and the space to do it, which right. is not normally a luxury right. that we right. have when tracking drums. Oh, that's going to be fabulous. It's going to be great. So At really some excited. point in time, we want to come take a look. You should definitely come check it okay. out. Okay, we, we will do that. Yeah. Excited. 100%. Cool. Why do you use Cubase to mix instead of... Uh... That's funny, actually. That's a good question. I was a Pro Tools guy from the very beginning. That's what I learned on. Well, come back over to us. Yeah. Well, no, 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 I haven't left. That's the thing. I haven't left. Don't oh, worry. Okay. I'm still there. Don't worry. I'm still there. Um, but I, I was like Pro Tools exclusive, no other DAW. I mean, I, I knew basics in Logic and in Ableton. Yeah. But for about 15 years, Pro Tools. And then this is also um, a because of Zed thing. Yeah. He worked in Cubase ah. exclusively. Wow. So when, when I started working with him, I just thought but to myself. tracking Pro Tools, though. I track in Pro Tools, yes. Okay. And yeah. that, that's what I was getting to, is okay, that yeah, that's it you know, like still there with, with that aspect. But he was only in Cubase, and I thought to myself, th this was before I, when I was still an assistant, I go. Sure. Because I really wanted to be, I'm like, I, I want to I want to work with this guy. Right. Th this guy's something special, he's so talented, like, right. and he's the nicest guy. I was going to ask that. So I was like, I'm going to do my homework. And I'm like, I'm just going to learn Cubase inside and out so that I, I'm like, I want to know more about the workings of it than he knows about it so that I can help troubleshoot. And I can also add, like, that as another, what should I say, chip on my shoulder to, yeah. The, yeah. to the, the project. More worth, more value. And then as I started to learn it, I started to like it more and more. And at the time, and, and still, I guess, and still now, it had features that Pro Tools just didn't have mm. yeah. that made mixing easier. And you could do things like, a really good example is the way that, that fades work and batch fading and automation. It's just faster mm. in Cubase mm. than it is in Pro Tools. Mm. It's just easier to do and quicker. Mm. Especially like if you want to do manual side chaining and things, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even dream of starting to do that in Pro Tools. That was the wrong answer. <laughs> I mean, I would only do that in Pro Tools. No, I'm kidding. No, okay, but... I, I, by the way, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a hypocrite because I'm going to say something that I'm not doing right now mm -hmm. at all hardly anymore. But I think you should learn every DAW, at least to some small part, because I, I get a lot of uh, mixes from different people with different uh, oh, yeah. DAWs, and so you've got to have that. You got to know a little about each one, about, absolutely. Yeah. At least enough to, if you get a project, to export files out of it to get it into somewhere yeah. familiar, right? Yeah. And, and there was also a highlight, what you said, which the audience should really understand. Mm -hmm. He prepared when he got, was going in to be with Zed. You got Cubase underneath you so that, you know, and, and you just can't say enough about when you see an opportunity, prepare for it. So you walk in, what is it, opportunity meets luck or something, but if, yeah. you, but if you don't, if you're not prepared, it's going to go by you. That's always just been kind of my philosophy, the way I approach things, is if I, if I see a situation that I want to be in, I try and learn more about it than anyone else around 100%. me. And therefore, like, if the opportunity presents itself, I'm ready to go. Yeah, be the man or the woman who is ready when the opportunity comes up, period, dot. That's just the way the game is. Yeah. Um, now... The, um, but before you continue, yes. I don't mean to interrupt. Please. I do want to also obviously shout out to Pro Tools because I don't want to. I don't want to say like because right. I still love Pro Tools. And when it comes to tracking, especially tracking vocals and then going back and comping vocals, still all in the Pro Tools world. Got it. It's yeah, I, it's still I, though. It's still my preference. I would say there's no perfect DAW. There isn't. No. If you learn two or three of them, you might can get to perfection at that point. But yeah. Well, and also I think that it's it's workflow. Mm -hmm. So it depends on also what genre and type of music you're making. Uh, one doll will be better for you than the other because Absolutely. of the features it has. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we were, uh, I was recently in a Netflix meeting with their head sound, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we were in one of their big screening rooms and he was explaining. Now, this guy's been on our show and he just knows everything like super good. Remember, we had Ozzy and this other guy from oh, Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was the other guy and he's the head guy. And he was literally explaining out something about Pro Tools and why they at Netflix use something else. And a lot of it was stuff can get to things quicker, things that fit streaming, things yeah. that were easier. Um, but I also think that with the technology coming so fast mm -hmm. that everybody has to be careful about not letting technology use you. 
yeah. you have to use it. Yeah. Is that fair? That is very fair to say. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's an art to that because you can think you're being busy with all the technology and you're really not. Yeah. You're not you're not getting the content better. Right. You're you're fiddling while Rome burns. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And then, and it's it's a hard thing, particularly with young people, to say. Yeah. Because you got 20 plugins, you might only need one for a few minutes and get off of it. There's a lot of bells and whistles out there. Yeah, man. But it, uh, keeping it simple is always the best. And, and Dave you only ever need a few things. Dave always has said this since we, since I've known him long before the show. You got to have your gut. Mm -hmm. You got to engage it and engage your ears. Yep. And if you got to feel. You know, yeah. when, when we do AI conversations, one of the lines that resonates with people is, I'll say, you know, computers can't cry. Right. You know, and there's something in there that is uniquely human mm -hmm. yes. that I'm not saying it can't be competitive with, but it can't do it like you can do it. But you have to know that you should be doing it as opposed to letting something else At the end of the day, you're still making the choices. Even if it's giving you suggestions, you're still saying yes or no 100%. to what's happening. So. 100%. Because yeah. I, I do like some that, of the That AI reminds stuff. me, like, like did, you, did you jump on a scale to actually be allowed to use the nickname Skinny? <laughs> oh, um... I don't think it's uh, like a legal official thing. <laughs> I think it is. I, I, I would love it to be. I know that somebody else has the license plate that says skinny. I have the one that has two Ys. Well, there you go. And I ran into the guy one day. I, I, I ran into the other car in California <laughs> that has the actual plate. Oh my plate. God. Um, and Did you kick his ass? I, 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 was, I was waiting. I actually waited to see whether or not the person would come back to the car because I was like, is there any chance right, we can, can negotiate this, this yeah. plate? Yeah. Um, but the, the nickname was uh, was given to me in the studio. Now, the other issue is, um, good issue, is that we throw a little athleticism into our show any time in a show called Batters, in a segment called Batters Box. Usually, exactly. And mm -hmm. usually what you want to try to do is just knock Dave's block off. So there's no, there's no, no pressure. You can literally say, Dave, go to hell. That can be one of the answers. And it's just fine. <laughs> and so I'm pretty sure that won't be one of the answers, but. But if you have to default. All right, Dave, you ready to tee yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we Let's go. Let's do it. Live drums. Uh, what aspect? Oh, <laughs> nice. Came back with a question. Well, I mean, nice. It's a lot to that. It's a big one. Yeah. Major or minor? Minor. Favorite synth? Um, serum. What? Serum. Yeah, I like. You know, yep. Yeah, I like. Loops. Um, none if possible, but I would say splice. Good answer. Good answer. Headphones. Uh, let's see. AKG. Um, what are the? the I've, I've used them for years. I always forget the model number, though. You're gonna kill me on this. Okay, so that's one for me. Yep. Groove. Um. Always perfect to the grid. Compression. Uh, LA2A. Tempo or BPM? Uh, BPM. MS. I guess yes, midside. <laughs> sure. Stereo bus. Ozone. Oh no. <laughs> I lost that one. Uh, you did good. No, you, you, you got it right. <laughs> Saturation. Ooh, good one. Um, either A800 or Nanny. If, you're, if your studio caught fire, what piece of gear would you want to rescue? Uh, my laptop. Z no, try again. <sighs> okay. Um, what? Yeah, that's it. That's probably not. Um, I think that I would probably grab, I'd probably grab my monitors if I could just take them. I would grab my speakers. Hmm. I mean, good work. That, that, would be, that would be the one. Outside of the actual thing that, no, that was great. You yeah. did good. You did real good. And also, what you guys don't know is that we just passed a historical milestone, because it's the first time ever in Batter's Box where Dave emulated a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> went, <laughs> I almost, I almost jumped on and went clear. I didn't know where it was going with the buzzer thing. The MS, the MS question threw me off because yeah. it, it that's it's a yes no or how often or it was, it's, it's hard like one word. How well, would I? It was your code. I. I, I is that that's what you were? To be, to be honest, I, I, I like the um, I, I'd like to, I like questions. I like answers that, that that take take our audience and give them a little bit of yeah. knowledge. You know, yeah. So oh, you did good. You did great. I, yeah, I tried. I tried to just go off the top, just not anything. thinking of any context. Yeah. It's like no. a like a show. Yeah, we're just yeah, just hit it's, a new it's groove. It's just a fun thing. It's not that. Silly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can't you can't force anything out of me. It won't it won't come across <laughs> right. So. <laughs> do you ever participate in because we do, and you'd be fantastic in. I find that there's a hunger for knowledge mm. out there. And 
There are certain brands, one would be Apogee, where they're conscious of the education market. They're conscious of making sure people know things. Yeah. And, and JBL is much like that as yeah. well, too. Um, and I think oftentimes the product has to come with a human mm -hmm. and somebody who's willing to, in, you know, share and inspire and all that kind of stuff. Do you ever, are you ever open to doing things like that? hundred percent. If I love something, I'm all about talking about it. Okay. Okay. Forever. The, the, the thing that's really great is when we can get our folks to come learn from you because they can never get to you. They never think they can get to you. Mm -hmm. The impact that you'll have on people is, is stunning. So I'm. I'm fully open to anything in okay. that realm. I, I never, I always, I always think though that I, I do a bad job of explaining things and I'm not good at teaching, but other people say different. So I think I just have to maybe get past that and just. I mean, you're talking to a, a guy who has a you know, pretty hot show in audio, who was not an audio guy. You know, I was a manager when I came in and I still sort of approach it as I'm not an audio guy. Yeah. So how can I get to things that would be interesting to non-audio people? Yeah. And, and somehow you, you work through it. So, you know, here Herb, we are. Herb, wouldn't you say that, that, that a majority of, of, of uh, electronics is just jargon? Once you master the jargon, you kind of you can do anything. Well, that's, that's that, you, you. You've really done a good job of. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about a guy who thought a stereo bus was how you got to Sepulveda. <laughs> like, I, I, I had no, I had no, and I'm amazed at how many people think I'm an audio expert. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm good at the business of it and the connecting the dots and mm -hmm. building things in it, and understanding stuff. And I leave the technical stuff to the people who know because I can just yeah. call them and say. Hey, what do you, you know, I mean, I saw Ted Sarandos, who's the CEO of Netflix, and he says, I don't necessarily know, but I can call, you know, Guillermo de Toro and ask him a movie question. Right. So it makes me, you know, so that's kind of my approach. But but we have educated so many people, or were you, I think last time we were in about 150 schools as curriculum. Wow. It's crazy. That is crazy. It's crazy. But I've never lost sight of the fact that let me be a portal so they can get to you. Right. Like we get enough love, so I'll be calling. That's the point. The um, phone's always always open. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, DP. Can, uh, we, can I have one more? Oh, you can have several more. Everybody likes to know. Describe your gear, because we all want to know your gear. Oh my gosh, I'm all in the box. Okay. So, basically, other than the the monitors that I have, um, I use a, an Apogee Symphony uh -huh. for my front end. Uh -huh. And everything I do is, is with plugins, unless I'm tracking. So on the mixing side, it's all in the box with plugins. Mm -hmm. Tracking, I still prefer to use analog gear okay. for everything that I'm recording in. So when you're working, how do, how do you know when you just shouldn't do anything? Well, I, sometimes I do more than I need to. How do you work? How do you solve that? Um, I almost always do more than I need to, to be honest with you. I'm pretty <laughs> bad at that. All mixers do. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, a mix is never sort of done. It never is. It, it really isn't. And then you just sit there with a half a dB here and there and you're just, yeah. you, so, I, you get better at it, I yeah. guess, over time. So listen with this. We're in a moment now where simplicity is the best way to go. So yeah. I think it's a, it's a fight between trying to figure out something new and, you know, it's the it's that saying that only a good horse jumps as high as it has to. Right. So that's that's, true. that's kind of what this is. Great line. You that can you can jump as high as you want, but that's inefficient. And I, I only normally do that when it's I'm not on a time crunch with a deadline uh -huh. and I want to try and discover something new. Right. And I will actually try and do that in everything that I do. Mm -hmm. I'll take a tried and true method of a process that I have mm -hmm. and I will try and do it a little bit differently to see if I can get it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of that, I will only jump as high as I have to because I know that this, this works and this is good for this. Yeah, that's some deep stuff. Thanks, man. So, Man from heaven for our audience. I mean, that is exactly the point. You don't have to over jump. You just have to reach the bar, yeah. make it excellent, make excellence your standard, and it will be good enough. It'll, it'll be plenty. And yeah. then you've got some reserves left if you need to jump higher. Yeah. Do you ever think you've finished a mix? No, not really. <laughs> I, How can we change that? I, I, it's just killing me. It, I, I think it's, uh, well, at least for me, I'll end up hearing, every time I hear the song after it's finished, depending on where I am, if I've slept, what environment I'm in, <laughs> yep. I'll hear something a little different about Absolutely. it. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, I wish I, wish I would have changed just that little thing. Yeah. But yeah. I know that it's only me. 
Yeah. And I know that no one else is paying same attention to that and no one can hear it. And no, it's mix, just, mixer remorse is a big part of you yeah. guys' culture. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then I, I sometimes have um, a bad habit of I'll be, I'll be working with an artist and they will sign off on the mix and say that it's good and it's done. Just to stop and, you? And I'll be like, just, just one more thing for right, me. Right, just one right. more thing for yeah, me. Like, I, 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 know, I, I know you don't hear it, but just one more thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. sometimes, sometimes a and get a little upset with me and like, no, we need, we need it now. I'm like, I'll, I'll deliver it. it. Okay, you can have it. Well, the one thing as we wrap up um, that we, is important to do is shout out to Buffy Hubel Bank. Buffy! We love Buffy. Buffy. Buffy Shout out to Buffy for sure. Amazing yeah. manager yeah. and the wife of Josh Goodwin and the manager of Skinny. So we we love her. Yeah. Um, yeah. Buffy, Buffy's the best. Yeah, she is. And 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 ultimately for all you guys in the audience, this is what you're emulating. This is what you're shooting for. You want to be able to use technology in proportion. You want to know that giving back is important. You want to stay collaborative. You want to stay open. And you want to be a good human being. Remember, your gut is important. Your ears are important. Sometimes when you have emotion coming up, that's when you know you're hitting the sweet spot. So don't let technology get you. Make sure you use it. Make sure you keep tuning in. Make sure you come back. We got a bunch of stuff coming this year. Shout out to Becky and Harmon for being at the Harmon Experience Center. It has been absolutely fabulous, and we'll see you next week.